Okay, good evening. I'm Wendy Warren, Director of Education at Holocaust Museum Houston. Welcome to the Gerald S. Kaplan Endowed Lecture held yearly in conjunction with the Max M. Kaplan Summer Institute for Educators. For their support of the Institute and Lecture, Holocaust Museum Houston would like to thank the Max M. Kaplan Teacher Education Endowment Fund, the Gerald S. Kaplan Endowment Fund, the Anna and Emile Steinberger Scholarship for Teacher Education, and the Texas Holocaust and Genocide Commission. For tonight's lecture, please post your questions in the Q&A located at the bottom of your screen. We'll get to as many questions as possible at the end of the lecture. Tonight's lecture, titled The Nazi Menace at Home and Abroad, is presented by Dr. Benjamin Carter Hett. Dr. Hett earned a law degree at the University of Toronto and practiced litigation in Canada for four years before earning a PhD in history at Harvard. He has taught at Harvard College and the Harvard Law School and since 2003 at Hunter College and the Graduate Center, City University of New York. He is the author of The Death of Democracy, Hitler's Rise to Power, and The Downfall of the Weimar Republic, and The Nazi Menace, Hitler, Churchill, Roosevelt, Stalin, and the Road to War, named an edu editor's choice by the New York Times Book Review. His other books, including Burning the Reichstag, an investigation into Third Reich's Enduring Mystery, winner of the 2015 Hans Rosenberg Prize, and Crossing Hitler, the man who put the Nazis on the witness stand, which won the 2007 Frankel Prize and was made into a documentary film and a television drama for the BBC. Dr. Head has been the recipient of fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation and the American Council of Learned Societies. Please welcome Dr. Head. All right, well, thank you very much. Um, I'm really honored to have the chance to um, give this lecture this evening. So thank you very much to uh, Wendy Warren and to the uh, Holocaust Museum Houston for the invitation. Um, what I thought I would do is talk a little bit tonight about a few themes that represent a kind of synthesis of what I've written about in my last two books that Wendy mentioned. Um, the Death of Democracy, which is about the rise of the Nazis to power, and the Nazi menace, which is sort of carrying the story forward and talks about what happens after the Nazis were in power and how democratic leaders and some non-Nazis in Germany tried to deal with the threat that Hitler's regime posed and how they even tried to sort of figure out what that threat was. So I want to uh, talk about, about four themes I'll sort of go through. And I, I sort of selected the things that I want to talk about because I'm going to sort of come at these things from an angle that's not always the way historians talk about these things, that in some ways is coming at these things with, I think, a bit of a different angle than what you sometimes get in uh, some of the books, some of the you know prominent documentaries and films and so on that have been done on these subjects. So I'll talk for a little while and then hopefully um, uh, you'll have some questions and we can sort of move on into a, a conversation. So let me start with one basic point that I think it is really easy to lose sight of when we think about what Hitler and his regime were and when we think about the threat that they posed to the world. One thing I think that's easy to lose sight of is just how new the whole context was in terms of politics, in terms of military affairs in the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s. So let me just say a few words about some of the things that were very new, which explain some of what happened and which explain some of what people were trying to deal with at the time. First thing that was new was an entirely new kind of warfare. This is coming out of the First World War, which had really introduced the concept and the practice of what we call total war. And in fact, it was coming out of World War I that the very term uh, total war was coined. Um, and I'm going to um, switch over to my PowerPoint so I can show you a few pictures. And I'm going to actually uh, jump down a little bit uh, to uh, a picture of a guy who more than anyone else was responsible for both the development of the practice of total war and defining the term. This is Erich Ludendorff, uh, 
who was in effect the second in command of the German army in the second half of World War I. Uh, he was really kind of the brains of the operation. And he, more than anyone else, was the one who thought about organizing German society, the German economy, and the German armed forces for a maximum war effort. Coming out of the war, Ludendorff spent a lot of time reflecting on what had gone wrong. And it was in his post-war writings that he started to develop the concept of total war. The term total war actually comes from a book that he wrote uh, with that title, published in the 1930s. Um, and his concept of what total war was and what it required for a society was very interesting. For him, it was largely a matter of absolute mobilization of all the resources of a society. So to succeed at warfare, um, a society had to have everybody working in one way or another, working in industry or mobilized for the armed forces. There had to be complete ideological conformity, which would have to be spread by massive propaganda. There had to be a complete crushing of dissent uh, so that there's no one getting in the way of the war machine. And only in this way, he thought, could a country, particularly Germany, be ready to meet another challenge. And so Ludendorff's whole project in the 1920s and 30s was trying to sort of advocate a way that Germany could fight a rematch of World War I, but this time win. And the main reason this is important is that in the early 1920s, Ludendorff came into contact with a young political activist who had just gotten out of the army, who didn't really amount to much in 1921, but who would become a big deal later. And you can probably guess who I'm talking about. I'm talking about the recently demobilized private first class Adolf Hitler, who became a bit of a protege of Ludendorff and evidently thought very carefully about what Ludendorff had to say about creating a society that could run a total war. And ultimately, Hitler's regime was very much a fulfillment of Ludendorff's project. Um, it's important to understand the newness of this whole aspect of a war that could involve a whole society and also a war that could be destructive in the way that modern industrialized total war could be. And this is another thing in the context that is important. By the time we get to the 1930s, and especially by the time Hitler's regime is in place, world leaders have to think about the fact that the next war is going to involve terrible new weaponry, notably, bombing carried out from the air, which even in the 1930s, everyone expected would completely level cities in a matter of hours or days or at most weeks. It's been said that people in the 30s expected the next war uh, to look like what we think a nuclear war would be. And as it turned out, the technology for that wasn't there yet in the 1930s, but people thought it was. And so this is part of the expectations that people have. And so when politicians are reacting, to geostrategic threats. This is the reality they're thinking about, but it's important that it's all really new. One interesting, I think, kind of partly linguistic and, and partly substantive point um, is that when Ludendorff talked about total war, he, uh, he also talked about a totalitarian society to bring it about. And he thought that only a totalitarian society could wage a total war. So the interesting point here is one definition of a totalitarian society is a society that is permanently organized for total war. And that's another way to think about the kind of regime that Adolf Hitler ultimately created. So that's one aspect of the world that's new in the 1920s and 30s. There's another one that might be even more surprising, and that is that even democracy itself is fairly new in the world at that time in several different ways and in several degrees in various countries around the world. So first of all, there was a democratic wave after World War I as um, the authoritarian powers that had been the enemies of Britain, France, America in World War I, as they collapsed and as the Russian empire collapsed, um, there was a wave of democratization, especially in Central and Eastern Europe and to some extent in East Asia. And a number of new states came into existence. And as they came into existence, they mostly came in the form of democracies. So that's one part of the new democratic wave of the time. But even in what you might think of as the core traditional democracies, to some extent, democracy was new. So 
for instance, in Great Britain, um, about three times as many people could vote after World War I as could vote before. That's partly because women uh, were enfranchised for the first time, but even for men, the right to vote in Britain had been tied to property and taxation prior to 1918. And after 1918, it was just adult males could vote. And so that tripled the electorate. Something close to that happened in the United States when women were enfranchised and when the huge waves of migration of the early 20th century began to precipitate out into the electorate. Uh, the American electorate was about three times as big by the 1930s as it had been at the start of the 20th century. So even in what you might call traditional democracies, these are really new democracies in the sense of the scale of people who can actually participate in, in political uh, actions, in voting, in campaigns, and so on. And this fact then interacts with a third fact that's new, and that is that the societies of the 20s and 30s we're experiencing a massive communications revolution. And again, this is something that we may forget, but actually it bears you know, some remarkable similarities to how we experience our world today. So if you, you know, think about some of the new media, radio is new in the 1920s. It's basically a technology of the 20s in terms of mass impact. Film, same thing. Um, and these media are really revolutionizing the environment. Uh, in which this new greatly expanded democracy takes place. Now, that leads to some changes in how politics gets conducted. And you can look at this um, with varying degrees of darkness and cynicism, depending on, on your outlook. Uh, in Western democracies, uh, we could say that the new media environment and the new politics leads to uh, new professions known as public relations and political consulting. And in the United States, these people are sort of the poster um, boy and girl, if you will, uh, Leon Baxter and Clem Whitaker, who founded a political consulting firm uh, called Elections Inc. And they had a very non-illusioned rather cynical take on how you persuaded a mass electorate to vote for a certain candidate. And they made no bones about it. They said, facts didn't matter. You know, the truth didn't matter. Uh, you had to keep things simple. You had to repeat them. Uh, as they said, Mr. and Mrs. America are not very smart. Don't give them ideas. Don't burden them with ideas. Give them simple ideas repeated over and over again. Also mudslinging honest or dishonest mudslinging. Their most famous campaign probably uh, was for uh, in, uh, the governorship of California in 1934, in which they made sure that uh, the left-wing writer Upton Sinclair was defeated. One of their main techniques was to make sure uh, that people associated certain ideas with Sinclair that actually weren't his. But what they would do is they would run in newspapers quotes every day that supposedly came from Sinclair. In fact, they were things that characters had said in his novels, but the words were attributed to Sinclair and they were always damaging. And when asked about this later, Leon Baxter kind of shrugged and said, our job was to make sure he didn't become governor. And he didn't, and largely because of their um, cynical but clever campaign. Now, in a democracy, you could call that public relations or political consulting. Um, in a dictatorship, there would be another word for it. Let me, sorry, let me get to uh, this picture. Here is the guy who was a master of how this kind of thing gets done in a dictatorship. Josef Goebbels, who was uh, Hitler's propagandist, he was the propaganda director of the Nazi party for a few years before they came to power. And then all through the Third Reich, Goebbels was the minister of propaganda. And he was very much the mastermind of the Nazis' message. And his ideas on how propaganda worked were strikingly similar uh, to Baxter and Whitaker. The same uh, uh, desire to repeat a simple message, a gut message, make it a sort of gut punch, uh, repeat it over and over again. Don't get complicated. Use images as much as possible. Use film. Uh, film could reach people emotionally in a way that a speech could not. Uh, radio could be a powerful medium, and Goebbels made extremely effective use of radio, as did Adolf Hitler. Um, Goebbels was, in a sense, more forthright about describing what he did by calling it straight-out propaganda. 
no euphemisms about public relations for him. He called it propaganda. He was proud to be the minister of propaganda, quite a new thing, by the way. No country had ever had a minister of propaganda before, at least not so named. And so this is another part of the environment of the 1930s. So there's this feeling in the 1930s. On the one hand, some people are very concerned that there is no more rationality in public discourse anymore because the mass electorate can't handle it and because you have people like Goebbels and you have people like Whitaker and Baxter really playing to the irrationality of voters. Um, and so that is a real concern that many people have. For others, it is an opportunity. Goebbels and Adolf Hitler would have flat out agreed that they exploited the irrationality of the people they campaigned to. They would have said, this is kind of the opportunity that the new world creates for a different kind of politics. All right, so with that, let me switch to the second thing I wanna talk about, which is how it was exactly that the Nazis came to power. And here again, I'm going to put a slightly different spin on this than what is sometimes said. So the most important thing here, I think to stress is that in the period of time when Germany was a democracy and Adolf Hitler and his National Socialist Party were campaigning for power. Let me go to a picture of him, there he is. Um, uh, it's not like Hitler got up and with every speech said, vote for me and I will bring about a genocide, vote for me and I will bring about a war. I think we sometimes imagine that is what he said. And so Germans who voted for him were voting for that. I think we also tend to imagine, at least in kind of what I might call unfairly, maybe history channel history, we imagine that this message had an impact on almost all Germans and there was kind of near universal adulation for Hitler and his party. Neither of those things are true. As they were rising to power, here's what the Nazis really were. Uh, in terms of the message they put out and how and why that resonated with enough voters to make them successful. What they really were was what we would today call a populist protest party. In particular, they were a protest party against the effects of economic globalization, which was not a word that people used then, but it was definitely a thing that was happening. Um, there's a fascinating passage in Hitler's less famous book, if you will, not the famous Mein Kampf autobiography, but uh, the book that has the imaginative title, Hitler's second book, it really does, which he wrote in 1928. There's a fascinating passage there where he talks about German companies outsourcing operations to China. Yes, I'm not kidding. He's talking about this in 1928. And in many other ways, uh, what the Nazis were talking about was how trade deals um, disadvantaged, especially German farmers. How, of course, the whole reparations system coming out of World War I by which Germany had to make payments to the victorious allies and a complicated growth of loans and financial arrangements around the reparations, how all of this was seriously disadvantaging Germany. And the Nazis were a protest movement against all of this. And the other side of the coin that's important then is who this message resonated with and who supported the Nazis. Um, important thing to understand about Germany in the 1920s and 30s is that Germany uh, had a distinction that would be a little bit familiar to us in, in America today, a distinction between uh, what you might call blue cities, you know, um, big cities where the electorate was generally left-leaning, and then the countryside, which was more rural and generally more right-leaning. Um, and the Nazis succeeded massively in rural areas where the electorate was generally Protestant. Uh, the Nazis did not do very well in big cities, which were more diverse um, uh, and where the electorate tended to be working class people who didn't generally vote for the Nazis, um, or in some cases, minorities. The obvious one is Jews. There were some others as well in Germany. Um, let me show you a, a graph that I think makes this quite clear. Um, when Political science oriented historians talk about German politics in these days. I'm gonna lay a bit of jargon on you, but I, I think the point is, is important. Um, they talk about political confessions. What this means is not political parties, but sort of larger groups that each of the parties fit into. And if we look at Germany that way, 
we would say that in the 1920s and 30s, there were three main political confessions in Germany. One is the Protestant middle class confession, one is the Catholic confession, and one is the socialist working class confession. And that's basically what this uh, chart here shows. Um, and what's interesting is despite the famous instability of politics and governments in Germany between 1918 and 1933, um, voters stayed almost completely within their confessions. And when voters moved to another party, they virtually always moved to another party within the broader confession. And that's kind of what these bands show. So what, what this shows is support for the major parties in Germany over time from 1918 to 1933. And the real action, the real story is in the upper part of these bands. So if you look at the band, uh, basically that yellow band that says DDP, if you look at from that up to the top, that's what we would call the Protestant middle class confession. And if you look over on the left side where we're starting in 1918, where the democracy begins, uh, it's dominated by what we're basically sort of liberal or conservative, more or less centrists to right-wing uh, parties that represented a Protestant and middle-class constituency. And what you see happening over time, Brown is the Nazis, right? So what you see happening over time is the Nazis basically move into that confession and they crush those other Protestant parties. So by the time you get to 1933 on the right-hand side, you see the, the thickness of the sort of brown bar. That's the Nazis having taken over that entire Protestant middle class grouping, which is about a third of the electorate. But then that's the best they were going to do. The Nazis were not and did not ever do better than that in a free election. And this too reflects their message, their message about a protest against globalization, a protest against you know, international influences on Germany. It resonated with this band, but it doesn't resonate with the Catholic voters the Catholic voters are the sort of thin purple and then the black line you see there in the middle, you see from left to right that holds up pretty well. And then the, the bottom, the uh, red and sort of uh, dark red and orange bands, those are the various socialist or communist parties and there too. They lose a little bit by the end, but it holds up pretty well across. What the Nazis really got was that Protestant middle class grouping. But even that wasn't enough to get them into power. To get into power, they needed elites. Um, and this is the other part of the Nazis coming to power, which I think is an important part of the story. Hitler in uh, the parliamentary election of July 1932 got 37% of the vote. That's the best that he and his party ever did in a wholly free election. And that wasn't enough to get them into power. To get into power, Hitler had to be nominated to the chancellorship by the president of Germany who was this guy, Paul von Hindenburg von Benekendorf, to give the sort of formal full name. There's actually a lot more middle names involved there, uh, normally just referred to as Paul von Hindenburg, uh, who had been the commander in chief of the German army uh, in the second half of World War I, and then was elected president of Germany in 1925 and elected to a second term in 1932. And it was the president under the constitution who would pick the chancellor and thus install basically the administration, if you will, into office. And Hindenburg basically refused for a couple of years to even consider the idea of making Hitler chancellor. Um, how it actually happened is a long and complicated story, which I won't um, belabor you with uh, tonight. Uh, but the sort of quick version of this is there were powerful elite uh, groups and especially powerful elite individuals who came out of big business and the armed forces who carried out a sort of lobbying in, in a couple of directions between about 1929 and 1933. Partly they lobbied Hitler, trying to make him, you know, quote unquote reasonable. Partly they lobbied Hindenburg, trying to get Hindenburg to see his way clear to making Hitler chancellor. And through a lot of sort of complicated maneuverings over the space of a few years, it eventually came to pass that Hindenburg sort of relented early in January 1933. The reason is actually pretty interesting. There's a circumstantial case that I make in my book, The Death of Democracy, that Hindenburg was almost, in a sense, getting blackmailed with the threat that he might be impeached. There, there were two different impeachment processes uh, 
um, under the German constitution. And he had put himself in jeopardy of being vulnerable to both of them. Uh, and in a sense, the Nazis and their elite allies were threatening him and saying, basically, make Hitler chancellor or you're going to get impeached. And finally, he relented and made Hitler chancellor on the 30th of January, 1933. Now, here's uh, the, the third point I want to make, which is how a democracy can really get subverted is when it comes from within. Uh, and this is the story of not so much Hitler getting to power, but then consolidating power as a dictator, because it's important to keep in mind, Hitler wasn't a dictator on January 30th, 1933, when Hindenburg made him chancellor. Uh, at that point, Hitler was a chancellor like every chancellor since 1918. He was the chancellor of uh, a constitutional democracy. He was supposedly operating within the framework of that constitution. But he very quickly broke out of that frame and over the uh, roughly six months that followed, he dismembered that democracy piece by piece, done from within, and that's the important point. There are a couple of significant landmarks on the way. Um, one I want to mention is this. Um, as soon as Hitler got into power, he called a, another election because he thought being in power, he could probably win a majority. And then with a the majority, as, or in particular, a super majority, two thirds in the parliament, he could change the constitution and then really make himself a dictator. Um, and you could argue, I would argue, historians debate this a little bit, but you could argue that he had a pretty clear scenario as to how he was going to do that. And he kind of went step by step um, to break out of the limits of the constitution and to put himself in a position to be dictator. The first step was this, um, literally four weeks to the day after he had become chancellor and six days from the day of the election, a fire broke out in the Reichstag, Germany's parliament building. Um, to this day, it is uh, debated who actually set the fire. Um, Hitler claimed right away that it was, quote unquote, the communists. And he used that as a pretext to get President Hindenburg to agree to a draconian uh, emergency law, which basically completely gutted the constitution and gave the government um, the right of arbitrary arrest. Uh, the right to shut down political parties, um, and very importantly, in Germany's federal system, the right to take over the governments of federal states. Uh, you could argue, some have argued, that it's that instrument known as the Reichstag Fire Decree, which effectively made Hitler a dictator. Um, as I said, there's still debate over who actually set the fire. Uh, I wrote a book about that subject, and I could go on for hours about it. Uh, which I won't, I will spare you uh, that this evening. Um, let me just say that I have made the case that the evidence is now clear from documents that have only become available in fairly recent years, that in fact, the Nazis set the fire to give themselves a pretext for this decree, which I think is sort of an intuitive case. Um, there are other historians who argue it's a bit like the Kennedy assassination, and there is a sort of crazy guy who broke into the building and set the fire by himself and the Nazis didn't know it was happening. There are many reasons why I think that theory has problems and it probably was the Nazis, but the debate is likely to go on. In any case, the result is clear. Hitler got the decree. This gave him and gave his administration formidable new powers. The next step after the election was held, the result for the Nazis was actually a bit disappointing. With all the advantages that they had, not only of incumbency in a regular sense, but now having the Reichstag fire decree in their pocket, they still only got 43% of the vote in an election that wasn't exactly free, but it was free-ish. And even so, they only got 43% of the vote, so not a majority. Hitler had a, a scenario that he wanted um, the parliament, the Reichstag, to pass something called an enabling act, which would be legislation that would give uh, his cabinet, all of the parliament's lawmaking powers for four years. And so that would give him and his cabinet complete lawmaking authority, and, and that would really make him a dictator. Uh, to do that, he needed a two thirds vote in the Reichstag, which he couldn't do with his own party or even with his coalition partner, a smaller conservative party that had 8% of the vote. So he basically partly arrested his way to a two thirds majority. The communist deputies, of which there were about 90, were all arrested. Um, and he intimidated the rest uh, into voting for his decree. I should say, I said the rest, I should say the 
94 member social democratic uh, caucus voted to a person against, to their very great credit, uh, voted against the Enabling Act, but Hitler still had a two thirds majority. So then this was on the 23rd of March, 1933. So he's been in power, you know, basically six, just over six weeks. Now he has complete lawmaking authority and all of the arbitrary powers of the Reichstag fire decree. So now he really kind of is a dictator. Over the next few months, he consolidates his power. He uses his, his new lawmaking powers to outlaw every other political party um, and to uh, state that only the Nazis can operate as a political party. And his regime went through a policy uh, or a series of policies known as in English, more or less coordination in German, Gleichschaltung, which basically was a process of taking every organization that could even conceivably be a basis of opposition and Nazify it, uh, you know, down to things like um, professional associations, lawyers and doctors, professional associations, even, you know, sort of local choral societies. You would get rid of the previous leadership, put Nazis in charge of it because Hitler understood that any organization could be a possible basis of resistance. So he got rid of all of them. And that process was pretty much complete by the summer of 1933. So there he is as a dictator. Now, let me shift to the focus of looking at what this means to the world. And I'm actually gonna do that in, in two stages. I wanna talk a little bit about some of the Germans who tried unsuccessfully, of course, to kind of restrain him. There is an element here uh, there were a number of people, especially in the high command of the armed forces, especially in the higher ranks of the diplomatic service, um, in the intelligence services, basically what we would call national security people. There's an element here of what we might call adults in the room. There are a lot of these people who see themselves as the adults in the room who are going to kind of keep Hitler strapped down, and they think they can at first. Uh, and the whole sort of story of the years between about 1933 and 1938 is the story of how Hitler kind of breaks away from the adults in the room, if you will. Let me tell you one story that kind of illustrates this. Um, it's the story of, of what is known as the Blomberg Fritsch scandal. Let me uh, sip ahead to this. So this is the military high command, basically, as it stood in 1937. These are the major figures in the story I'm going to tell you. Uh, the the good-looking fellow on the left is Werner von Blomberg, who was the Minister of War. Uh, next to him is Hermann Göring, who was the commander of the Luftwaffe or the Air Force. Uh, next to Göring is Werner von Fritsch, who was the commander in chief of the army. Next to Fritsch is Erich Reder, Admiral, who was the commander of the Navy. Now, here's what happens. In November, 1937, so we're fast forwarding a bit, Hitler holds a meeting with these men uh, and basically, he says to them, uh, we need to have a war. We need to have a war to conquer territory in Eastern Europe. It's got to happen in the next few years. Uh, you've got to get ready. You've got to prepare your services and get ready for a war, probably in the early 1940s, but it might come sooner. Now, it's not that Hitler hadn't said these things before. He had, say, he had said these things before, and he had said these things before to these very men. But for some reason, maybe because by 1937, Hitler had really consolidated his power and he was obviously somebody they had to take a bit more seriously, they took him more seriously this time. And to their partial credit, what Hitler had to say at this meeting worried them. And they start kind of running around talking about a military coup possibly to get rid of him because they don't want Hitler to drive them into a war. Not by the way, that they are great humanitarians and certainly not that they're pacifists. They're just pragmatic fellows. They are military commanders who know that if Germany gets into a war once again with Britain, with France, maybe with the Soviet Union, certainly with the United States, Germany will lose. They understand coming out of the First World War that Germany doesn't have the resources to win a war against the wealthy kind of world imperial democracies. So they wanna keep Hitler from leading them into a war they will lose. This is why they start thinking about a military coup. This, by the way, is the kind of initial germ cell of what's going to become in six more years, the famous Valkyrie plot that culminates in the attempt to kill Hitler in 1944. It's, it's kind of rooted in this moment. Now, the thing is Hitler knows um, that these men are very skeptical of his plans. They argue with him at the meeting. 
Um, and we know what happened at the meeting because Hitler's adjutant was there taking notes. His adjutant was this guy, Friedrich Hosbeck, well, the guy on the left. Um, Hosbeck is a guy who I've actually come to sort of like a bit from my research, a sort of classic humorless soldier, absolute straight shooter, would fearlessly tell Hitler uh, what he thought, which was often not what Hitler wanted to hear. And at this meeting in November 1937, Hosbach was there taking the notes of everything that Hitler said, wrote it down into a document that has become kind of immortal in history as the Hosbach Memorandum. And the conference is sometimes called the Hosbach Conference. So coming out of the Hosbach Conference, Hitler knows, whoops, sorry, wrong way. Hitler knows that in particular Blomberg, there on the left, and Fritz the third from left, that they are putting up resistance to his idea from a war. Now, as it happens, Blomberg had picked that very moment to decide he wanted to marry again. He'd been a widower for several years, and he had fallen in love with a young woman who had a bit of a lurid past. Uh, she had been, in effect, a porn star and a prostitute, and she was about 26 or so years younger than him, uh, but he wanted to marry her. Now, by the standards of the German officer corps of that time, a field marshal and a minister of war could not marry a prostitute and a porn star. That's just not in the mores of the officer corps. Blomberg doesn't fully realize this. But when Hitler hears about this, and here I am, I'm telling you my version of, of the story based on what I think is the evidence. I should alert you to the fact that historians disagree about this a little bit, but I think the evidence is clear that when Hitler hears about Blomberg's marriage, the penny drops and he thinks, I've got a way to get rid of this minister of war who's causing me problems. And then he thinks about Werner von Fritsch, and he knows that a year or so before, there had been allegations that Fritsch was gay and was um, having relations with Hitler youth boys, which was actually not true. Uh, it's pretty clear that that was not true, but Hitler didn't care. It was a useful fact. And so Hitler dredges up that one too. And the result early in 1938 is the scandal that becomes known as the Blomberg Fritsch scandal where Hitler now kind of pretends, you know, I'm shocked, shocked that my minister of war is marrying a prostitute. And I'm shocked that my commander of the army seems to be gay. And of course I have to fire both of them. And he does. And he replaces them with people who are going to be much more compliant. And then he takes the opportunity to purge all kinds of people who he thinks are getting in his way. Um, this includes a number of senior diplomats uh, and other military commanders who have all been sort of putting up friction and putting up resistance to Hitler's drive to war. So in this moment in early February, 1938, Hitler takes a major step forward to consolidating his power and takes a major step forward uh, to sort of solidifying his drive to war by getting rid uh, of men who could have been effective in stopping him from positions of power. Doesn't keep them from being active in the resistance as some of them continue to be. Um, but uh, uh, it does remove his immediate problem with his chain of command. All right, the last little thing I wanna talk about in the last few minutes uh, is then the response on the other side. So I've been talking here a little bit about the response of some people in Germany who were certainly not raving Democrats. You wouldn't say that these men were Democrats, but they weren't Nazis either. And they didn't want all of the horrors that Hitler was going to bring. And in their way, they tried to stop him. Let me talk a little bit about democratic leaders and how they started to face this. And here I need to come back again to the fact that everything about the danger that the Nazi regime posed was new. One thing I found really interesting in doing the research, uh, especially for my, my second of these two books, uh, The Nazi Menace, is when you read the minutes of the British cabinet in 1937, 1938, 1939, when they're debating what they're going to do about Hitler as he's getting more and more aggressive. It's really interesting how their thought process goes. They keep talking about Kaiser Wilhelm of Germany, who they had you know, been against in World War I. They talk about Napoleon, whom Britain had fought a century before. They talk about Louis XIV, whom Britain had fought a century before that. They're thinking in these very traditional geostrategic terms they see Hitler as just the latest version of Louis XIV or Napoleon or Kaiser Wilhelm. They don't see an ideological dimension. They don't see greater dangers from Hitler than had come from those earlier geostrategic threats. The guy who does see it a bit differently, not at first, but eventually, is Winston Churchill. Uh, 
And this is a somewhat, I think, neglected um, aspect of Churchill's role in this time. Everybody knows that Churchill was the guy standing up for years saying, you can't appease Hitler, we need to be ready to resist him, and so on and so on. And, and you know, everybody knows that he was ignored in British politics and even mocked all the years he was saying this. What's much less known is the way Churchill was starting to articulate that message by 1938. Hitler, or sorry, Churchill gave what to my mind is one of the greatest speeches of his life, and it's not one of the best known, but one of the greatest speeches of his life um, in October 1938, right after the famous Munich settlement, when the then British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain agreed that Hitler could take over part of Czechoslovakia, the Sudeten region of Czechoslovakia. And in response to this, Churchill gave a speech, which has some really interesting lines in it. And the sort of key one is, in sort of responding to the idea that the British needed to have friendly relations with the Germans, he said, sympathy for the German people, yes, our hearts go out to them. But, and this is the key one, he said, the British democracy cannot be a friend of this brutal tyranny. So Churchill is starting to frame it as democracy versus tyranny. And this may seem really obvious to us, but this was not so obvious to many people in the 1930s. This was not sort of standard geostrategic thinking. And so Churchill is really introducing a new element here. All the more surprising, given that he's you know, a highly conservative aristocratic figure, but he's actually one of the more forward thinking in some ways about how to deal with the Nazi problem, as is Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And I want to sort of conclude this by looking at a sequence of events, which I think is really interesting and is also a bit underappreciated. It's a sequence of events in which Nazi Germany and the democracies, especially the United States, are increasingly defining each other in a kind of action and reaction way against each other. So the sequence goes more or less like this. In November 1938, there comes one of the infamous events of Nazi Jewish persecution, um, the famous events of Kristallnacht. I'm sure most of you are, are well familiar with it. Um, this was the first real outbreak of mass violence against Jews by Nazis in Germany, um, in which you know, um, uh, synagogues were burned and businesses and homes were broken into, and in some cases, people killed around 20,000 or so uh, German Jews were arrested and dragged off to concentration camps. In the wake of Kristallnacht, uh, a leading American politician gave an important speech. The leading politician is this guy, Harold Ickes, Roosevelt's Secretary of the Interior. And uh, Ickes gave a speech in late 1938, in December 1938, um, uh, actually in honor of Hanukkah, and he gave it to a Zionist society in Cleveland. Um, Ickes was not Jewish, but he's choosing this forum. And his speech was a flaming uh, condemnation of Nazi barbarity, but in particular of Nazi anti-Semitism. And what was really important about Ickes, I think, is that he linked the idea of a crisis of democracy and persecution of Jews. He said, as democracy began to spread around the world in past centuries, one of the signs of it was Jewish emancipation. So when we see Nazi persecution of Jews now and persecution of Jews elsewhere at the time, that's the sort of clearest sign of a rolling back of democracy. And you can imagine the reaction in Germany to this speech was severe. Uh, they wanted uh, the Roosevelt administration to retract it, Roosevelt refused. And then when Roosevelt gave his State of the Union address just a couple of weeks later on the 4th of January, 1939, Roosevelt then took this idea forward about um, sort of defining democracy in opposition to Nazi persecution of Jews. And Roosevelt framed it in a very clever way, I think, to appeal to an American electorate that was isolationist and to try to get Americans to think more in a sense aggressively about meeting the Nazi challenge. What Roosevelt did was to frame opposition to Nazi Germany as an opposition in which uh, Christianity and democracy are linked and they are in opposition to the brutality and the barbarity of what Hitler was doing. And he made the point a little broader too than Christianity. And he said, religious persecution generally is the thing that we are against. That is the hallmark of tyranny. We're opposing that democracy is about freedom of religion. 
And then Hitler responded to that in one of Hitler's most famous speeches, but the context is not so well known. The context of the speech that Hitler gave on the 30th of January, 1939, it's not always recognized that he's really responding to Ickes and to Roosevelt. And the really famous passage of Hitler's speech is what uh, is sometimes referred to as his prophecy. Hitler himself sometimes referred to it as his prophecy speech. I'm just going to read you um, a little bit of what he said. Uh, he closed his speech, or it comes near the end, by saying, today I will again be a prophet. If international finance jewelry in and outside Europe should succeed once again in driving the nations into a world war, then the result will not be the Bolshevization of the earth and thus the victory of Jewry, but rather the elimination of the Jewish race in Europe. So there are a couple of things here that are important that I want to kind of underscore. One is the reaction to what Ickes and Roosevelt have been saying. Um, two, the fact that he's linking here, you know, international finance and Bolshevism and saying they're both part of the Jewish conspiracy. And he's saying a world war would be a war in which Germany is fighting both of those things, you know, basically capitalism and communism. That would be a world war. And then that would lead to the annihilation of Jews. So this is January 1939. World War II hasn't started yet. But Hitler's saying this in reaction to what uh, Ickes and Roosevelt have been saying. Now, let's flash forward. Here's where I'll kind of end up. Let's flash forward to 1941. Um, in August 1941, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt and Winston Churchill met uh, on a battleship off the coast of Newfoundland, Placentia Bay, for what was called the Atlantic Conference. Now, keep in mind, the United States is not in the war yet. Pearl Harbor hasn't happened. Uh, Britain's kind of hanging on by its fingernails, and by this point, the Germans have invaded the Soviet Union. Uh, and the war is going in the Soviet Union well at this point for the Germans. But here, in August 41, Roosevelt and Churchill meet, and they come up with a document called uh, the Atlantic Charter. And the Atlantic Charter is weirdly in the context, it's a kind of war aims plan for two allies, even though the United States isn't in the war. They talk about, and this is the language they use, they talk about what the world will be like after the final defeat of the Nazi tyranny. And they're basically laying out a plan for a peaceful, liberal, international world where there will be freedom of religion and freedom of speech and democracy everywhere. And these are their goals for after they crush the Nazi tyranny. Now, what's interesting, well, there's lots that's interesting about the Atlantic Charter. It, uh, it is recognized to this day as the founding document of the United Nations. Um, uh, but it's also interesting how Hitler responded to it. It's pretty clear, uh, the evidence for this comes, for instance, from the diary of his propagandist and friend, Josef Goebbels, who wrote quite a lot about Hitler's reaction to this particular document. It's pretty clear that Hitler kind of hit the roof when he learned about the Atlantic Conference and the Atlantic Charter. And the reason is he had expected to defeat the Soviet Union soon at that point. And then he expected the British would see reason and make peace with him. And then together with the British, he could face the United States in a kind of final world war. But the Atlantic Conference signaled that Britain and the United States were now effectively allies against him. So in a sense, he sees the United States now being fully in the war as he is fighting the Soviet Union. So in Hitler's mind, and like I always say to my students, please don't ask me to make this make sense, but this is how Hitler's mind works. In Hitler's mind, Germany is now in a world war against Anglo-American capitalism and Soviet communism. That's Hitler's definition of a world war. And Hitler had said, you know, um, two and a half years before this, that what would follow from that is the annihilation of Jewry. So it is in no way, shape or form, in my view, a coincidence that it's just after this that measures that are gonna bring about the Holocaust in its final and most organized form start kicking into gear. A whole bunch of things like um, Jews are finally forbidden to emigrate from Europe. They need to start wearing the yellow star. Deportations from Germany start to camps in the East, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All of these horrible you know, bits of machinery of the Holocaust really start to spring up after this August 1941 conference because in my view, Hitler has seen that that world war is coming. So just to sum that up, the democracies 
ultimately sort of define the Nazi menace by in, in some ways sort of figuring out what they are and what they should be about. And by starting to see what the Nazis are about and defining themselves as democracies in opposition to the barbarity of the Nazis. At the same time, the Nazis or Hitler at any rate is kind of defining his program and his Nazism in opposition and in, in a kind of dialectical process against what the democracies are doing. And that's another phenomenon of what I would call the Nazi menace. All right, um, there's lots more to say, but I will resist saying it and I will, uh, I will stop there and I'm uh, happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Ha. That was fantastic. And yes, you piqued everyone's interest, especially in the Reichstag fire. <laughs> so here's your first uh, long question. Can you elaborate a little bit on the new research or documents that emerged regarding uh, the Reichstag fire and how you came to your conclusion and, and why are these documents more recently becoming available? Sure. Okay. Um, I could probably spend three hours answering that question. So one really quick answer, a uh, self-interested one is uh, I would refer you to my book, Burning the Reichstag. Um, a slightly longer answer. Let me try and um, really sort of encapsulate this. There are a lot of documents that were in, uh, until the end of the Cold War, were in Moscow or were in uh, East German archives uh, and were not accessible to uh, very many researchers, certainly not Western scholars. Um, and uh, in particular, there's a huge pile of documents. There's about 300 uh, folders of documents from the trial that was held in the fall of 1933 in Germany for the alleged perpetrators of the Reichstag fire. And with those documents are all the documents of the police investigations. And if you sift through that and piece it together, even though the police were not exactly you know, honest and the trial was not exactly a fair one, still the evidence sort of starts to peek through and, and, and I think it's sort of a collage. You start to get little bits and pieces that enable you to put the picture together. There are some other things. I spent several years just kind of um, traveling around Germany, looting archives uh, for stuff. And there are, uh, there are documents that came out of proceedings after the war for, for instance, police officers who investigated the fire at the time, and then after the war had to go through what were called denazification proceedings, and this all leaves a paper trail, and there's some interesting things there. Um, there's, a, there's a kind of wild story here. Um, the guy who most influentially wrote about the Reichstag fire was actually a German intelligence officer named Fritz Tobias, not a professional historian, but an intelligence guy. He wrote a book in 1962 on the fire saying that the Dutch um, stonemason Marinus van der Lubbe was kind of like Lee Harvey Oswald and broke into the Reichstag and set the fire by himself and Hitler didn't have anything to do with it. Um, I was able to meet Tobias. He was a very old man when I met him and he's since passed away, but I met him and I saw a little bit of his private archives that he had put together in part with his resources as an intelligence officer. Uh, over the years. And interestingly, his private massive archive um, contained documents which ran straight against what he had put in his book. Uh, and in fact, pointed squarely to the Nazis as the perpetrators. Um, his document collection is now publicly available in the German Federal Archives in the city of Koblenz. Um, and it hasn't been thoroughly mined yet. People are still going through it. But if, if I would sum it up, I would say this. Um, there is uh, sort of scientific evidence. There's evidence about how fire behaves in buildings. Um, and a number of scientific experts who have looked at this in the 30s and now have said one man with um, the tools and the time that Marinus van der Lubbe had could not possibly have set the fire that destroyed the inside of the Reichstag. There had to be more than one person. And basically, if there was more than one person in 1933, it would have to be Nazis. There's just no other way. That's one thing. Second thing is there were a couple of people after the war who were in a position to know who made statements saying it was Nazis and even identified a particular guy who's a quite plausible culprit who could have been the leader of this operation. So, you know, certainly it wasn't one crazy guy alone. Probably it was Nazis. That's kind of my position. Okay, thank you.
Um, here's another one. Were there upper level individuals within the legal profession, lawyers, judges, et cetera, that resisted or protested the Enabling Act or Nazi policies after the consolidation of power? Yes, absolutely. Um, um, uh, in various ways. There, there were people, there were kind of adults in the room types, uh, as I've talked about. There were legal versions of that too. Um, maybe the best example is a, a really admirable guy named Hans von Donani, who was a judge on the Supreme Court in Germany. And then at, at various times, he was also an assistant to the uh, Minister of Justice. And he was one of these people kind of working against the system from within. Uh, and he paid the price for it uh, in the kind of roundup of um, uh, resistance people. Actually, starting in 1943, he got caught up in it and arrested and was eventually executed. Uh, then there were people outside the system. Um, actually, a, a good friend of mine, a fellow named Douglas Morris, who's written several books on this kind of thing, has just come out with a book on a man named Ernst Frankel, who was a trial lawyer uh, in Germany in the 30s and also a legal scholar. And what uh, Douglas's book shows, and it's extraordinary, is um, that uh, Frankel, who was himself Jewish, in the 1930s was actually acting as a defense attorney in trials of you know, anti-Nazi resistors. And he was, he was running political trials against the Nazis and, and sort of getting away with it. I mean, the, the nerve that it took, and in a certain sense, the luck that it took to be an advocate in political cases against the Nazis after 1933 is extraordinary. Franco got away with it and he got out of Germany and, and came to America in, in 1938. Um, but that's, that's, that's another one. And I wrote a book some years ago about a guy named Hans Litten, who was another anti-Nazi lawyer incredibly brave in how he went after the Nazis. Hans Litten actually subpoenaed Adolf Hitler to a trial in 1931 before Hitler was in power and cross-examined him for several hours and ground him into the dust. And you can maybe guess what happened to Hans Litten. He was arrested actually the night of the Reichstag fire and spent five years being horribly abused in various concentration camps before he finally died at Dachau in 1938, age 34. Hans Litten is someone else I could go on about for the next three hours, uh, so I, I will spare you, but Hans Litten was an extraordinary man, one of the most admirable people I can think of, incredibly brave, brilliant, um, anti-Nazi lawyer. Okay, um, we have a lot of educators in our audience tonight uh, that are part of the Summer Institute here. Uh, so do you have any recommendations for our educators on resources or activities that would help them work with their high school or middle school mm. students um, mm. on Hitler and the rise of the Nazis? Oh, that's a great question. Um, you know, uh, there's an organization that uh, probably a lot of you would know of, but if you don't, it's worth um, getting in, in touch with, uh, an organization called Facing History and Ourselves that I've actually been doing some work with lately. Um, that does exactly that kind of thing, um, that uh, works with educators on developing programs, you know, about things like this, about human rights, um, about the Holocaust, about, you know, um, racial issues in the United States, uh, and things like that. So that, that's, they have a great website, they have all kinds of materials, um, that's well worth checking out. Um, yeah, other than that, I, after that, I'd, I'd, I'd have to think, I guess. <laughs> Okay, great. That is a resource we work with all the time here. Uh, you mentioned uh, von Hindenburg and um, possibly getting impeached or it had allowed himself to be put in that position. Can you give us a, a quick summary of what uh, that was about? Sure. Uh, there are basically two things he had done, or uh, there's one thing he had done and there's one thing he might have done, which um, could have got him in trouble. So first of all, he was given an estate by the government as, as kind of, you know, a grateful nation rewards its great commander and leader, a uh, house and a lot of land in East Prussia. Um, and he transferred it to his son. He, he put the title in his son's name, uh, apparently to, in, to avoid inheritance tax, which was not proper, not legal. And he could have been impeached for that. Um, the other thing, uh, pertains to what might have happened. The alternative, by January 1933, for complicated reasons, mostly of political deadlock, the alternative to having Hitler come in and be chancellor was to have someone else be chancellor and govern outside of the constitution, at least for a period of time. Like what, what the scenario they had in mind, 
was Hindenburg would use his emergency powers as chancellor, uh, as, as president, sorry, uh, to name a chancellor and to allow that chancellor to govern basically by what we would call executive order to dissolve the Reichstag and not call another election. And the constitution said, if you dissolve the Reichstag, there has to be an election within 60 days. The plan was, the alternative plan was to dissolve the Reichstag, just not call an election and use the presidential executive order powers to basically operate as a dictatorship until things calmed down and maybe the Nazis went away. And since that was unconstitutional uh, you know, on, on its face, he could in theory have been impeached for that. And what the Nazis were saying in January, 1933, because the Nazis knew that this was the other scenario, you know, as opposed to Hitler coming to power, the Nazis were saying, if you do that, we'll impeach you, you know? So it seems that some combination of those two things kind of wore on Hindenburg, because even a week or so before Hitler came into office, Hindenburg told one of his sort of associates, he's fit at best to be my post minister. And then, you know, a week later, he's made him chancellor. And it sort of seems like this pressure had gotten to him. Okay, let's see if we can get just about two more in before we run out of time. Uh, do you think that Hitler believed that the Jews were the cause for the Atlantic Conference um, that evolved into the, the World War Nazis against everybody? In a sense, yes, because, and again, uh, don't ask me to make this make sense, but how Hitler's mind worked is that you know, um, Jews were basically behind Anglo-American democracy and Anglo-American capitalism. And this was a message the Nazis actually hammered home all the time. They said, you know, Roosevelt may not be Jewish, but we think he kind of is. His name's probably Rosenfeld or something. And you know, Churchill's controlled by the Jews and British and American capitalism is just totally Jewish. So like they, they saw this as very much a kind of Jewish conspiracy. So you know, the sort of coming together of Roosevelt and Churchill the Nazis just said, aha, there it is. It's kind of what we always thought, you know, that there it is right there. And, you know, on top of it, they're kind of allies with the Soviets who are Jewish communists, you know, in the Nazi way of thinking. So, you know, it, it seems if you're Hitler, it seems like the complete fulfillment of what you had always thought. Okay, thank you. And our final question, we'd like to know what you're working on now. Do you have any new projects? <laughs> are you writing another book? Yeah, I'm always writing something. Um, you know, I'm, I'm kicking around a couple of different projects right now, actually. Um, how far they proceed, I'm still finding out, but I'm interested in them right now. So one follows a little bit on some of the things I've done. So there was a kind of famous serial killer or infamous serial killer in Berlin in 1940 and 41, who um, attacked, raped, sometimes murdered women on the commuter train in Berlin, the S-Bahn. He's sort of known to history as the S-Bahn killer. And in 1940 and 41, the Berlin police put enormous effort into trying to catch this guy. And I find this intriguing because this is at exactly the moment that exactly the same people are gearing up or actually perpetrating the Holocaust. Um, and so I've been sort of playing around with the idea of writing a book about this just to sort of work on that contrast of this serial killer and the police effort coming from like the notorious police authorities like, like uh, you know, Otto Neva and, and uh, Heidrich and so on. And they're trying to catch the serial killer as they are you know, perpetrating the Holocaust. So that's one. Um, the other one would be changing gears a little bit, but picks up on a little bit of what I was talking about tonight with Roosevelt maybe. Um, and I've become quite fascinated by the United States in the late 1940s. And what fascinates me is coming out of World War II, you would kind of think that the mood would be a little bit like the early 1990s, like a little bit of like total triumphalism, kind of, we've just won the greatest victory, yay us, like, you know, let's celebrate. You'd think it would sort of be that. And actually the late 1940s was, I think in many ways, a very dark time for all kinds of reasons. Um, you know, McCarthyism is one, the kind of legacy and the increasing worry about the atomic bomb and then racial conflict, which was really ramping up in the late 1940s. I think all of these are sort of ingredients of um, a time which was really conflictual and really full of fear and really full of conflict. And also not coincidentally, I think in some ways foreshadows and, and maybe explains a lot of the politics that we're experiencing now. So I'm um, 
that's something else I've been sort of kicking around for about the last six months or so. Well, thank you. Those both sound fascinating and we look forward to reading your next work. Thank so you. thank you so much for this evening. It was really enlightening. I know that we all learned a lot and I wanna thank our guests for joining us tonight. Uh, we hope you'll join us again for a special webinar on the Holocaust by Bullets on June 22nd, presented by Yahad and Unum, a Paris-based nonprofit organization established by Patrick Father Dubois. Registration is free and can be found on our website on hmh.org. So thank you again and good evening to everyone. Thank you very much, bye-bye. Thank you, bye-bye.